Chapter 20 is genes within populations. So today's objectives, we are going to look at the Hardy-Weinberg principle and how alleles change within populations. So we know that genetic variation is differences in alleles in populations. There's lots of genetic variation between us, hair color, eye color. Um, but genetic variation is that raw material that natural selection works on. Now evolution is how something changes over time. Um, Darwin never used the term descent with modifications, so I just want to make that clear, where like one organism has a certain trait and then it kind of evolves over time. Darwin never used that term. But through time, species do accumulate differences, and so as a result, their descendants are very different from their ancestors. So in a way, we can say new species arise from uh, former existing ones. So here's a nice little diagram of um, genetic variation among giraffe, um, as well as moths. Yeah, did you guys know that giraffes had different genetic variations? I didn't know that. No. Okay, now natural selection is the driving mechanism for evolution. So the definition, and I, it's a lengthy one here, it says some individuals in population possess certain inherited characteristics and then produce more surviving offspring than individuals that lack those characteristics. So basically that the trait that's being passed on has an advantage over other organisms, allowing that organism to survive and reproduce and pass on that trait. So we will be talking about Darwin's finches. We will be talking about marsupials of Australia. But you know, here's, here's a flow chart kind of simplifying this where um, here I have genetic variation and then maybe this variation is not advantage, it doesn't work out for the organism in the, in the environment, and they die, and then these guys pass on, so now there's more populations like this, but then maybe something changes in the environment where these don't thrive, and so on and so forth. So. Now, Darwin was not the first to propose the process of evolution. If you remember Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, he believed that um, organisms could acquire traits over time. So he thought, with giraffes, why do giraffes have long necks? Well, they just continued to stretch their neck, and as you know, they kept stretching their neck, and as a result, their necks got longer. So therefore, this organism acquired that trait over its lifetime. This is different from Darwin. Um, Darwin states that variation is not created by experience. It is created by pre-existing genetic differences among individuals, maybe a mutation. So the question becomes, how in the world can we monitor how a population changes by looking at, you know, the alleles? And then this is where Heidi Weinberg um, is going to come into play here. Sorry, no funny comment of uh, two giraffes saying, stretch, stretch, think of your children. When was that one? Biology last year. I remember that. No. Okay. So we can look at the allele frequency and how alleles change over time. And allele frequency, they, they can change based on mutations, um, migration, so organisms, yes, animals do move, as well as chance events, maybe like a catastrophic, a catastrophic event, like a, a flood or a fire. An asteroid. <laughs> An asteroid. Um, so evolution can result from any process that causes a change in the genetic composition of a population. So here was the allele <laughs> um, frequency before something happened, and then maybe something happens where, you know, yellow, obviously, doesn't thrive well in the environment, and so on and so forth. So, so we call this study population gen genetics, where we study properties of a genes in a population, and we look at those genetic variations that are among different individuals within that species. So like I said, humans, we have a great deal of genetic variation. We have different blood types. We have genes that influence different enzymes. You know, if you're lactose intolerant, obviously you're lacking, it, lacking an enzyme to break down lactose. So we're studying all these alleles, and we can basically call it like a gene pool. So we're going to be looking at a gene pool here of a population. Okay, so change in frequency. Now Darwin and others... We did not know how genetic variation worked within populations. We know that Mendel, when he performed his experiments with pea plants, um, 
you know, he was performing it at the same time. But like I said, his work was unnoticed. It was lost in his notebooks. It wasn't uncovered until years later. A lot of scientists at the time believed in blending variation, which means that if you took a red flower, mixed it with the white flower, you get a pink flower. Or like the traits would blend, um, producing phenotypically uh, intermediates of their parents. Now, if this was true, then over time, um, our two variants, you know, red and white, should just disappear and all generations should be pink. But that wasn't happening. Okay. So why did genetic variation persist? Why did a population never compose solely of dominant individuals since dominant alleles mask recessive ones? Well, here comes the Hardy-Weinberg principle. Now, Hardy and Weinberg, Hardy was an English math mathematician and Weinberg was a German physicist. Um, their principle describes stable populations. They state that original proportions of genotypes in a population will remain constant from generation to generation as long as assumptions are met. And there's five of them, and we're going to go through them very quickly. And then I'm going to show you how Hardy-Weinberg principle actually works. We'll do some sample problems because you do have a worksheet um, on this. So the five assumptions is that no mutations take place. No genes are transferred, so there's no immigration or emigration. Random maiden does occur. Population size is large. And there's no selection. Now, if I have a population that's 25% dominant, 50% hybrids, 25% um, recessive, and I look at the next generation, and it's, and it's the same exact ratio, that means none of these five took place. Like, all five of these assumptions were met. If, however, my frequency changes, maybe I have more recessive alleles, then one of these five have been violated. And you can actually study to see, oh, was there immigration? Was there emigration? So when, that's how we use Hardy-Weinberg Hardy principles here. So a little bit about H and W. Instead of thinking about the consequences of mating between two parents with a specific pair of genotypes, like we do with Punnett squares, they wanted to know what would happen to the entire population when all of the individuals would, would, would breed. So they imagined that all the gametes produced in each generation go into a single bin that they called the gene pool. So I had um, warthogs, and you saw their alleles kind of going into a water hole. That's the gene pool. To determine which genotype would be present in next generation and in what frequency, they had to calculate what happened when two gametes were plucked at random out of a gene pool. So that it's a mathematical equation. So the simplest situation possible is that we have two alleles for a gene. And we are going to say that I'm looking at a big B and a little b. But in this equation, P stands for that dominant allele, and Q will be for that recessive allele. Now, in my gene pool, the two frequencies must equal 1, or 100%. So P plus Q equals 1. With me so far? Mm -hmm. OK, so all the dominant alleles, all the recessive alleles, when you add them up, they got to equal 100% or 1. So the dominant allele would be 100, and the uh, recessive allele is 0, then? <coughs> well, it could be. Or it could be 60, 40. It could be 55, 45, you know. Just the amount of alleles? Okay, so um, like I said, with the Hardy-Weinberg equation, it's going to have two alleles. We can actually call it a binomial expansion. So for example, if I have 100 cats, 84 are black, 16 are white, then the phenotypic frequency would be 0.84 and 0.16. We can uh, deduce this and figure out all the other allele frequencies, and I'm going to show you how. So let's assume that Little b, little b homozygous big, uh, is um, white, and black is the big b's. So p equals big b, q is little b. If I add them all up, it's got to equal 1. But we have three other genotypes possible. So little b, little b, big b, little b, big b, big b. All of these have to equal 1. Have I even showed you the equation yet? No. Good lord, what is wrong with me? <laughs> all right, the equation can't believe it. I need to add that to a slide. That's pretty important. Is it P4 plus P2? Yes. Okay, it's on here. It's on here? Uh, it's not on yours. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, I forgot I had animations. There P it squared. is. There's the Heidi Hardy Weinberg equation. P squared. That looks important. Plus 2PQ plus Q squared. That should equal 1? Yep, that has to equal 1. Yeah, you might want to maybe add that in there. Okay, so how this works. Okay, Herman, yeah, you can see this. If my white 
cats, okay? I have 16%. So that as a decimal is 0.16. So I know that 16% of the population were white. So I can put that in here because here's little b, little b. But I want to figure out what this ratio or what this number should be. So if I set up this equation, I have q squared, because that's little b, little b, really, equals 0.16. So in order to get Q by itself, I take the square root. So Q will equal 0.4. Okay. So that means 0.4 goes up here. Now, B, B plus, sorry, P plus Q has to equal 1. So this is 0.6. Hey, oh, we're Jesus. Hey, oh. What? Uh-huh, and then you can just deduce and figure out all the other ones. So then if I want to figure out the frequency for big B, uh, big B, it'll be 0.36. 0.36. 0.34. 0.24. 0.24. And then if I were to add these all up, they should equal 100. Yeah. Or 1. Which they will. 48. Which they do. They do? Yep. We're confident. Okay, yep. There we go. Easy peasy, right? Wow. Isn't that awesome? Just by Jess. How did you find what P equals? What? How did you find what P equals? Oh, because I know that you did it again. P plus Q must equal one. So I know my Q, which is 0.4. Solve for P. Isn't that awesome? Wait, so what? Elementary. Will always give you a percentage at first. They will give you something. Okay. And then from there. Sometimes they won't give you this. Sometimes they'll give you this. Okay. Sometimes they'll give you that. Awesome. Okay. Uh, so there we, that's how we found um, Big B. Okay, here's another one. I think. Escape out of this have this on my board. Yes, I do. Okay, so here's another example. Homework. It is short. It's really short. Yeah, we're doing that. Yeah, I probably, I know. Okay, so in an imaginary wildflower population, let's see if I get my pen here. Yeah. Uh, red flowers, big R, are dominant over white flowers, little R. In a particular population, the R, R genotype is 0.64. Calculate P and Q values. So I can draw out my little Punnett square. I know this is R, little r, r, little r, and they say big R, big R is 0.64. So it has to be 0 0.8, so the R's would have to be point, little yep. r's would have to be 0 0.2. So this is 0 0.8, this is 0 0.8, and I know that 1 equals P plus Q, so we know what our P is, P is 0 0.8. So our little r would be 0 0.2 then. Yep, so then Q's got to be 0 0.2. And then from there, I can figure out all the other, the rest of it, uh, the rest of it. yeah. So then uh, 0 0.8 times 0 0.2. Someone? 16. I vote that there's like six and of these 0.2 on times 0 0.2. 0 0.04. Three point, yeah, no, no, no. Are we sure we're doing this right 0. here? 0.4. I think it's 0.04. It's, it's going to be 0.4. It's going to be 0.4. Oh, 0 0.04. Okay. <laughs> There we go. I was like, it can't be 0.4. That's wrong. Okay. 0 0.04. There we go. How awesome is that? Yeah, we should have like six of these on the test, as I said before. <laughs> okay, now. She just laughs at me. <laughs> um, sometimes they'll uh, just give you like how many they observed, so they don't give you a percentage, so you have to figure out the percentage. So I, I threw this equation. How? What's the total population of my squirrels a here? Thousand. A thousand, and I have 250 <laughs> out of a thousand, so it's 0.25. So I just wanted to show you that sometimes they'll just give you a number, and you got to just figure out the percentage, and so then the work from there. P is 0.75, and Q is 0.25. Is that what you're saying? P and Q Does are 0.25. No, no, no. Okay, <laughs> let's just do this real quick. Here. Doesn't matter which one you put as P and which one you put as Q. Okay, it says assume that red is totally recessive. So, so R, R. R. Okay. All right, so that means that little r, little r is 0.25. So 
So then when I do this in the Punnett square, 0. 0.5 and 0. 0.5. Oh, okay. This is 0. 0.25. So then this would be 0. 0.5. So everything's 0. 0.5. Yep, everything's 0. 0.5. Good. All right. All right, you figured it out. Awesome. We're getting used to it. Started off with a little hiccup, but then we're fine. Okay. Oh, yeah. have to go on, though. Oh, okay. Yeah. more. So, like I said, how can we use Hardy-Weinberg? Well, we can actually, um, if the assumptions hold true and the frequencies do not change, then um, we can actually predict the future or the future population of that. Um, so this is how we look at evolutionary processes. Are they occurring or are they not? So if the Hardy-Weinberg frequencies are different, then I know evolutionary processes are occurring. If they're the same, then be like, oh, Nothing's occurring. It's just stable. It's a very stable population. Okay. Over the population not have like some mutations. Or... Well, like I said, we can look at it from a small scale, so like from generation to generation. But then we can start to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, with Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, you know, the genotypic frequency should be. 0.25 to 50 to 0.25 with the dominant to hybrid to the recessive. But let's say we have a population that is slightly different, 0 0.45, 0 0.10, 0 0.45. Well, now what's causing the excess of homozygotes? We could say, is natural selection favoring homozygotes over heterozygotes? Are individuals choosing mates that have similar, um, you know, with, with other mates that are similar to themselves? Or is there an influx of homozygotes from the outside of the population? So I could I could pick one of these questions and examine it to see if that's occurring or not. So, awesome. Okay. That was probably the easiest note we've had all year. Gosh darn it. Okay. Uh, section 2.3 to 2.5, we're going to look at evolutionary changes. So we're going to look at mutation, gene flow, non-random mating, genetic drift, and selection. Ooh. And that's just a... That's supposed to be an attentional blank slide, and I'm not sure why. Okay, moving on. <laughs> so the five agents of evolutionary change... The first one is called mutation. We know that mutation does change alleles, but the rates of mutation are actually really low, which means it has a low effect or a little effect on Hardy-Weinberg. In order for a mutation to really have um, a significant um, part in this evolutionary change is that it needs to occur in the gametes or the sex cell, the egg or the sperm. That way it can be passed on uh, in the individual's or chromosomes. Now, even if a mutation does occur in the gamete, it has to, there's still a 50-50% chance that it's going to be passed on because you, you're made up of one half of your mom and one half from your dad. So, um, therefore, mutation does not really occur frequently. And, eh, let's move this over here. Hey, cool, awesome. Okay, does not occur more frequently in situations that would be favored by natural selection. Um, we know that mutation, though, is the only way to produce new variation. So, therefore, mutations have to be hidden as recessive alleles. You maybe have heard of PKU before. One in 12,000 babies carry this homozygous form of allele. Without early detection and treatment, this disorder will lead to mental retardation. So like you'll see on gum, it says does contain PKU because um, it has a certain sugar in there that the individuals cannot metabolize and then it uh, affects their brain and, and development. So how would they treat it if they... Like, you just change your diet. Sugar. Oh. Okay. Yep, you just avoid that sugar. So you so permanently like, mess you up for life. When you're pregnant, mm -hmm. should you not magically accidentally do something? Nope, 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 nope. No. Oh. Plus it's a 1 in 12,000. Yeah. yeah. What are the odds? 1 in 12,000. Okay, so <laughs> right <on>. this, <laughs> this uh, slide depicts how um, mutations occur. So like here I have a population. If there's one genetic mutation uh, mutant and we add... Um, uh, antibiotic. So I think we're looking at bacteria here. And we add a, a, a drug that kills off, it's supposed to kill off every one of them. But if one's a genetic mutate, mutant and it survives, um, then the next population is going to have more resistant mutations and then it won't kill them off. Um, in this one, however, we have th this kill curve is depicted in this side, by the way. Here we have our bacteria colonies. Okay, and you see that there's different variations. See, this was very homogeneous, where it was pretty much all the same except for one. And here, it's hetero. There's a lot of different variations. So we add some antibiotics, but it doesn't kill off all of them. Um, and so then we, you know, they multiply and they produce, but then maybe one of them mutates. And then if we add, again, another addition of this drug, um, you can see that there are some. So now, the, now these are stronger 
And so... Yeah, that's how, they are stronger there. That's yeah. how they get uh, tolerant. Right. And, and the sad news is that we are running out of antibiotics that, because people abuse it. Oh, I have a little cough. Here's some antibiotics. And then all of a sudden, that bacteria is a lot stronger and resistant to that. Um, however, there is a little bit of hope here. They have discovered a new antibiotic. But the problem is we can't grow it in the lab. It lives in such an extreme condition uh, that we're having troubles re recreating those conditions in the lab. So there's a sliver of hope, and once we figure out how to grow it in a lab, then we'll have a new super antibiotic is it again. Extreme, is it extreme? No, it's actually like under extreme pressure, extreme pressure, and then it's also kind of in like a toxic soil. Carly, don't you think that they could recreate something like a jungle? Okay. Say that again. I don't know. I, I'll, I'll, again, I'll make a note. I'll look it up. Google it. Um, I learned about it in grad school last spring. Okay, so with mutations, um, you know, like mutations that occur from damaged DNA, and if the, da the DNA is not repaired, then it gets passed on and, and it becomes replicated. But mutations, there's always three outcomes. It's either going to help you, it's not going to help you, it's just neutral, or it's going to hurt you. So, you know. Okay, moving on. Second kind of evolutionary change here, gene flow, how alleles move between populations. So another agent of evolutionary change. Like I said, very powerful in animals because animals can physically move from place to place. Plants, you may not think of them as being able to move because they're rooted in the ground, but their pollen does move. Um, marine animals also migrate and move within the oceans as well. We can take a look at long-term patterns of mate selection and how it, that has changed the gene frequency. Like, for example, African Americans are largely of the West African descent, but there has been considerable influx of alleles from non-African populations, you know, because people have, um, you know, mated with them and, and, and so forth from other parts of the world. So here's a diagram just showing gene flow. Like, here I have a population, here's a population, and then some just kind of, you know, move and enter into a new population. Like... I'm not originally from Wheaton. I'm from outside of Wheaton, so, you know. Also, I moved away. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so non-random maiden shifts uh, genotype frequency. So this is the third type of evolutionary um, change or an ag agent of that. And there's two types of maiden. A sort of maiden where similar individuals are going to mate with individuals that look like themselves. When this happens... Um, it does not change the frequency of individual alleles, but it does increase homozygotes. The other type of maiden is dissortive, which means that they will mate with people that are not people, with or, uh, mate with others that are completely different, and as a result, you're going to produce a lot of heterozygotes. So here... Um, on one side, I have random maiden, like this beetle would prefer any of these. But with non-random, it's going to mate with something that's very similar to its own. Uh, there's been studies that show we have a single species of fruit flies here, but we divided them. And we fed one with starch, and we fed the other one with maltose. And we just kept, um, you know, generation after generation just feeding them the same food. And then what we did is we reintroduced them back to each other. And the... Uh, starch-fed flies preferred uh, other flies that ate starch. They would not mate with the maltose fruit flies. The maltose fruit flies would mate with maltose fruit flies. So in a way, did we really create uh, a new species here if they don't like want each other? Who knows? Okay, so it's, it's an agent of evolutionary change. And you can, I just like this diagram because of the nice little hearts between the two. You know, it's just like so cute. So the undesirable traits will diminish over time as organisms having those traits are less reproductively successful. Great example is the red deer in the British Isles. As you can see, the larger your um, antler mass, it seems, the more breeding success you will have. So maybe bigger is better in some cases. Moving on to genetic drift. Genetic drift may alter allele frequency in small populations. Now this is a huge difference between you know, like Hardy Weinberg, how that's an, a large population. Well, genetic drift is a small population. So in a small population, um, the alleles may change dramatically and randomly. 
As a result, drift can cause alleles to decrease fitness or to increase it. So it can go either way, but the key points are random with respect to fitness. That means that our allele frequency changes um, that it produces are not adaptive. Two, genetic drift is most pronounced in small populations. And then three, genetic drift can lead to random loss or fixation of alleles. And I have some great examples of genetic drift. And there's different types of genetic drift. So I think the couple, next couple slides here um, depict that. Okay. Moving on. No, you know, we could we could maybe third hour because I really don't want to do anything in chemistry today. Like, you know. Ooh. Ooh. Nice. We like hearing that. All right, genetic drift. So one type of genetic drift is the founder effect. So it's a group of individuals that immigrate to a new ge geographic area and they establish a new population, so we can call them pioneers if you want to think of that. But these pioneers, they don't carry all the alleles present in their source population because, you know, they were a part of a big city or a big country or whatever, and now there are only a few of them left and are found in a new area. So alleles will be lost. It could drastically change the allele frequency. Sometimes rare diseases could occur um, in this new population, or rare, rare syndrome. So some examples, Amish people, because they seclude themselves and they don't mate with the outside world, uh, really. So um, something that's very common in Amish populations is polydactylism, which means they actually have six fingers. What? So if you take a look at this picture here, um, there are five here, and then they have their thumb. What? Yeah, zoom in on that, zoom in on that. How could they get the picture taken? That's the real question. They were demonstrating. Like, that's a case study. You know, scientists went in and said, hey, can we just study you for a quick second here? Okay, bye. No, I'm just gonna... take um, founder, founder effects are also witnessed on islands. Islands are a great example for founder effects, so I actually have an example for that as well. Now, the founder effect, it's not rare. Um, you know, like plants, many of them are self-pollinating plants that just start from a single seed. So here's an example of the original population. Well, maybe a select few leave, start a new population, and now this, these are what the descendants look like here. New found in population, this is what the descendants look like. These guys are different from these guys. Another example of the founder effect is the Tristan de Canha um, Islands in the South Atlantic. It started by one Scottish family of about 15 people. The population did increase by you know, shipwrecks and births. In 1987, it was 296, seven family names. They looked at the mitochondrial DNA studies, and they showed that they all descended from five female founders. Because remember, you get your mitochondrial DNA from your mother. So that's like something that you all share. So they, they traced it back to five different females that started this population. Isn't that awesome? I was like three hundred people. Now, the population has a high frequency of a hereditary eye disorder, retinous pigmentosa. Now, I don't know... If this data um, is from this 296, because you're like, well, that doesn't seem like a lot, so I'm not sure if the population has decreased or not. But four islanders have the disease and nine are carriers at the last uh, encounter with this island. So this is where the island is at. This is what a normal retina looks like. This is what retinous pigmentosa looks like. And you can see it's cloudy on the outside. So normal vision. So it's like tunnel vision. Basically. Retinia's pigmentosa, huh. right there. That would suck. That would be annoying. So you have yeah. no proof? Do, do you think that, like, they're it's just, I'm sure they're just used to it. Just, just like, like when you see it. Yeah. Like when you watch a TV with the black on the outside, after a while you just, like, don't even notice it. No. Another type of genetic drift is the bottleneck yeah. effect. Yeah. So even if organisms do not move from place to place, their population can be drastically reduced in size due to, like, fires, flood, drought, epidemics, just kind of those catastrophic, catastrophic events. And as a result, it's going to reduce the number of alleles. So we call this a genetic bottleneck. I would even say zombie apocalypse could fit in this one as well. Nice. I always see things about how, science, they talk about how scientists actually discovered something in the brain that could like turn on, that could make you like a zombie. Well, there's uh, actually, we'll talk about that with ants. Is it crazy? It's awesome. So here's a, a diagram depicting this genetic <laughs> bottleneck. Here was the original population, and then some events just <clears throat> only where a few survive. So you kind of like tip the bottle, and 
for a small period of time, and a few come out, and this is your surviving population. So you've lost a lot of alleles. So an example of bottleneck, northern elephant seals, they were hunted down to just 20 in the 1890s, but the population has now recovered to over 30,000, but there's no genetic diversity because you, you only started with 20 individuals. So they, scientists are concerned about their resistance to certain pathogens. There's a great article about this um, if you want to look more into that. Another example of a bottleneck is the cheetah. Males are the usual Casanovas, but females are just as promiscuous. And so females will mate with several different males while they are fertile. And the reason for that um, is so that they have more genetic variation in their offspring. So here I have a female cheetah. It mates with multiple males, question mark, question mark, question mark to me anyways. Um, so the genetic variation among the cubs is extremely high because multiple fathers are the result of these cubs. And therefore, if one of them gets sick, eh, you still got two more that are strong and they're going to pass on their genes. Yeah, now... If the cheetah um, only mated with one male, so here's the cub offspring, and, and let's just say the genes weren't that great, and they were very susceptible to a pathogen, all of them get sick, well, there goes your offspring. Like, all that energy wasted, you know, so. Um, that was a nice pun. Cheating impacts. <laughs> cheating in <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> Yes, it's not uncommon. Um, so the reason why cheetahs have low genetic variation, though, is due to the last ice age, which was about 10,000 years ago, as well as recent poaching. So. I, I heard that, like, I think the manatees are not endangered anymore or something. Mm -hmm. I saw it on Twitter. <laughs> All right, and then the last evolutionary agent of change is selection, how selection favors some genotypes over others. There's two types of selection, artificial selection, where breeders will select for a certain trait that they like. And then natural selection, where you can say environmental conditions or nature um, selects the individual in a population, and as a result, that individual will produce more offspring. So I have a question. Yes. Did all dog breeds start out the same, or did, were some dog breeds like? Because how do you get from like chihuahua? Oh, to like um, no, the, they believe that they can trace it back to the wolf, what? and then humans domesticated the dogs. Most impressive. Yep. For natural selection to occur, three conditions must be met. There has to be variation among individuals in a population. And the reason for that is because natural selection favors certain traits over others. Uh, two, variation among individuals must result in differences in the number of offspring. So therefore, that variation must have an advantage for that offspring to survive and pass it on to the next generation, which ties in with three, that the variation must be genetically inherited. Uh, so environmental effects, however, don't play a role here. It's got to be passed on um, in the chromosomes, in the genetic material. So like in sea turtles, if the sea turtle eggs are placed in moist sand, then typically their shells are um, longer and, and wider. So that's an environmental effect. That's not something you can inherit. Now, natural selection and evolution are not the same. Like I said, natural selection is the process uh, the driving mechanism of evolution, and evolution is just the outcome. So here I have a wild mustard plant here. And if I select for different um, structures on this plant, I can kind of pr uh, produce different um, plants here, cabbage. like kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, kale. They all come from the wild mustard plant. You the yes, you have. So the result of evolution is driven by natural selection. Okay. So can you... Can you send us, like, the homework assignment? Yep, I'll do that. Um, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Clownfish. That's what I'm going to write down for tomorrow. Clownfish. Okay, so um, scenarios where variation might be better adapted to environments, selection against predators. Caterpillar larvae of, of sulfur butterflies. There are two types of larvae, pale green and blue. And um, sulfur butterflies like alfalfa, and alfalfa is green. So the pale green ones will thrive more than the blue ones. Um, maybe the, the fin shape of, of a fish could be an advantage um, because if it's, you can see here, it says large amount of surface area allows for sharp turns, quick starts to avoid predators, but there's always going to be kind of a downside to it. It might create drag, so the fish tires easily. So um, it will give it an advantage, get away, get to a safe area, pass on that gene. Most 
here color fur color uh, in in mice so a light colored um, mouse will thrive in the sand colored desert compared to on lava rocks and dark coat color would be um, favored in, in the lava rocks compared to the sand. So you notice this brown mouse kind of sticks out. Yeah. And Dead. yeah, basically. Death vitality. Death from above mouse. Um, there could be selection due to climatic conditions. There is an enzyme um, that, well, actually, actually, not an enzyme, but the enzymes, um, their allele frequencies vary with latitude. Now, remember, enzymes are proteins, and proteins can alter shape based on temperature and pH. So with, we're going to look at temperature here. In the mummy chong fish, there is an enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase, dehydrogenase, um, which takes uh, lactose and produces pyruvate or takes pyruvate and produces it into lactose, something like that. But these enzymes differ in their optimal temperature range. So if it's colder, the protein will work a lot better. As you can see here, cold waters, the allele frequency is more frequent. And then as it gets warmer, as I go south in latitude, um, the allele or the enzyme doesn't work as well and it's not passed on. Um, fish that have this enzyme actually do thrive better in the environment. And then finally, selection for pesticide resistance. In our world, we have used, we have drastically increased insecticide. And as a result, the insects have evolved. Um, Roundup Ready is, is uh, they're kind of in trouble right now. They're kind of at the end of their rope, in my opinion. This is also translated into microbial resistance. So like with health, you know, like bacteria, like I mentioned with antibiotics. So there's a lot of bacteria that are antibiotic resistant, like MRSA or MDR-TB. MRSA. Oh, no, not God. MRSA. MRSA is the dirtiest disease known to man. Yeah. Oh, my. If I get it right. Uh, here's an example of a house fly and how it has evolved insecticide. So it could have a new gene uh, called PEN. So this is the gene name, PEN, that decreases the uptake of the insecticide. Or it could have the KDR gene, which is depicted down here, that decreases the number of target sites. So PEN decreases uptake, so it, it doesn't affect it. And then um, KDR, there's just not a lot of receptor sites for it to latch on. Now, there's, there were supposed to be pictures on here, but they have disappeared. But on page 403 in your book, beautiful, beautiful diagram. So I don't know why they didn't show up here. It's like they just disappeared. All right, the last section I think I'm going to cover today is fitness and its measurements. Fitness um, is when you increase the number of offspring that you can have. We usually think fitness is like, oh, you're fit, you're in shape, you're muscular, you're fast. Well, fitness in the biological world is different. It's basically how many offspring you can produce. So a phenotype with greater fitness usually increases in frequency. So maybe I'm looking at a population of toads with two different phenotypes, green and brown. Green leaves, on average, uh, four offspring in the next generation, while brown only leaves 2.5. So you can see the green has a higher fitness than the brown. And then if I were to figure out um, my uh, um, Hardy-Weinberg principle, you know, I can figure this out. So, Fitness is a combination of a few things. Survival, so you got to survive and pass on those genes. Maiden su success, so not only do you have to survive, but you need to find a mate. There's a lot of um, territorial large males that will mate with many females. Leaving those small males um, that rarely ever get a chance. So we call this sexual selection. And then finally, the number of offspring that you do leave behind. If a large female frog um, or fish, they usually tend to lay more eggs than smaller fish and frogs. So usually size does correlate to how many eggs you will lay. Sometimes traits, um, so traits can be favored by one component of fitness, but it could be a disadvantage. So if I go to the size of females, a large female may lay more eggs, but may die at a younger age because she's wasted so much ener energy on that, and as well as there's fewer opportunities for it to reproduce. So here um, is an, an example with water striders. Larger female water striders lay more eggs per day, but the larger uh, females survive for a shorter period of time. 
As a result, intermediate-sized females produce the most offspring over the course of their entire lives. Thus, they have the highest fitness. Makes sense. Yep. Ah! So are fat max. Oh my gosh. Okay, miles. should I just stop here? Yeah. Probably. Might as well. There's only seven slides left. We can finish that. Okay, quick. that sounds good.